so nice to see all of you. This is, I think, our last event of the season. And it's the last event in our Tzion series. I know some of you have been coming to our uh, Tzion lectures. This was our kickoff season. We hold once a month a dinner lecture on some topic related to Israeli history, culture, politics. And uh, we're so happy to have our own Dr. Brian Amkraut presenting our last session this evening. Before I introduce Brian, I just want to make a few comments. First of all, I want to thank all of you who are here who are supporters of the program. The Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University really runs so much on the generosity of our donors and our community, both individuals and also the foundations that support us. And I want to thank all of you who do support us and also encourage those of you who are interested, who take classes with us, who benefit from the wonderful activities and programs that we have here, to please consider that are making a donation. Um, finally, in terms of upcoming programs, I usually have a long list of things. And because we're winding down the season, I really don't have that much to tell you, except keep your eye on our website because our classes and programs for the winter and spring are gonna be coming online gradually. Of course, you'll get your catalogs in the mail probably around mid-January. And since I don't have specific events to announce, I do want to draw your attention to things that are upcoming in the far future, which is our educational travel programs. You may have seen our beautiful brochure that came out a few weeks ago. I encourage you to look through it um, and to pay particular attention to the trip that I'm going to be leading together with Professor Jay Geller, which is the trip to Jewish Germany. We're going to be going um, to Germany to look at the memory and the shadow of the Holocaust there. Um, also, rich Jewish history that was there from as far back as the Middle Ages and before. And of course, the vibrant Jewish life that's in Germany today, one of the most populous Jewish countries in Europe today. So if you're interested in more information, please come see me. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Brian Amkraut, who is the executive director of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University. And in addition to his wonderful teaching, which many of you I know know here, he does so much behind the scenes to make everything that we do here possible. And um, just please give him a, a warm welcome for all of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alana. Uh, it's a pleasure not to have to introduce myself. Uh, so, um, uh, but Alana's really been a great addition to our team, and I know many of you have had the, the chance to learn with her as well, so I hope you'll take the opportunity to find a class with her uh, or maybe join her in Germany this summer. Uh, I will ask all your indulgence to hold questions until later. That's for a couple of reasons. I want to make sure I get through everything that I brought with me, which is a formidable amount uh, of material. Uh, and um, also uh, for the recording, I, I really want to be able to stay on topic so we stay on time. Uh, we will have ample time for questions, or at least what I hope will be ample time for questions, uh, either over dinner or immediately following dinner over dessert. Uh, so um, please just bear with me. Um, I've titled the talk this evening, Atzma'ut and Nakba, the Contentious Histories of Israel and Palestine, 1947 to 1949. Uh, someone remarked to me on the way in that what a festive atmosphere it was, and, and I think people are, are happy to be here, and I'm always pleased to join you. Uh, I anticipate that people won't be feeling so festive, uh, at least at the immediate end of my talk, but that's okay. Um, it's really meant to be uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, and to stimulate some conversation, uh, which I'm sure we will all enjoy afterwards. Um, another way of framing this uh, talk is to uh, look at this period as the founding of Israel and the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem, uh, which leads me to my first uh, caveat uh, in terms of language. Uh, it is so difficult, so complicated, to come up just with basic English uh, that people will allow you to use in good company when discussing this topic. Um, people wrote to me based on the short blurb that I put together for this course uh, that um, it's clear based on what I wrote there where I stand and what my intentions are. Um, and you know, I was pretty taken aback because 
you know, I, first of all, I, I doubt they know where I stand, uh, and my intentions are solely to do a good job of presenting the facts as we know them, um, but really to, to try to have some civil conversation around this topic. Uh, but the language that we use is so fraught with connotation uh, and meaning. Um, when you say the word refugee, uh, there's an implication there, at least someone's going to take it a certain way. Uh, when I use the phrase, uh, the creation of a state, as opposed to some other way of putting it, and there are many other ways of putting what happened during this era, uh, one might suppose that there's an implication there, again, uh, of built-in meaning. Um, so um, I uh, really ask of all of you to uh, be patient in terms of the language. Don't necessarily try to read too deeply into my attempt to use English properly. Um, and uh, you know, I will do the same with you. Uh, here's where I really want to begin, and that's with a few words uh, about historiography, myth, and memory, and then a look at the importance of historical context. Uh, when we look at this period, 1947 to 49, how we know what happened has actually evolved over time, and what people say has happened has evolved over time. Uh, and the people that I'm talking about are all sorts of people. They are people who participated in the events, the descendants of people who participated in the events, uh, commentators around the events at the time they happened, commentators on the events after they happened, uh, and indeed scholars uh, of uh, political science and history uh, how they understand what happened during this era has changed, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. Uh, most importantly, uh, there is some knowledge that, that we have now that we did not have uh, 50 years ago, uh, but certainly the politics of the day, whatever day it might be, um, have their impact on how people discuss this period. Um, so the historiography, actually, even the, the scientific study of the history is not consistent. Um, it changes over time. Uh, secondly, a little bit about myth. When we use the word myth, uh, one shouldn't assume that because we use the term myth that that means something is not true. Um, there are elements of some myths and some myths in their entirety that might be true. The importance of the term myth is how it is used, the implication of, uh, of, of that supposed history uh, for a particular population. So you can talk about a founding myth. Um, typically, most founding myths have some truth to them um, and typically uh, have some untruths uh, to them. Uh, and there are reasons for that, again, uh, connected in many ways to the discussion of historiography. And even when we talk about memory, um, it's not necessarily something consistent that we're dealing with. Memories change. Memories are shaped by events that happen afterwards. Memories are shaped by what other people tell you over time. Um, so we have these three um, pieces of evolving ways to discuss this episode uh, that, that have changed over time and that impact how we communicate uh, this history, this narrative. Um, for my part today, I'd like to emphasize more than any of those three the importance of historical context, of understanding that the era in which these episodes unfolded uh, is not the same era in which we live today. Uh, and uh, the types of things that one assumes uh, are, are, are proper behavior for individuals or states or other actors involved, um, which might seem um, either appropriate or inappropriate uh, today, must be understood in their historical context. That doesn't necessarily make them right or wrong. Um, I want to make them understandable as to why people or, people or groups or, or even states behave the way that they did. Um, and, and context is key to that. Uh, so uh, you won't necessarily have to agree uh, with, uh, you know, with conclusions if, if it looks like I'm bringing conclusions, but I, I do want us all to be able to understand uh, uh, that context. And in many respects, in terms of looking back uh, from our vantage point today, uh, that is the way in which some a measure of empathy for all the players involved might emerge, um, for being able to understand what was going on in that part of the world, in that time, um, and why people did what they did. Okay, so that's uh, my, my ways to get started. Uh, you can look at these two competing narratives, uh, really just from two competing maps uh, showing the same particular place in the world. Uh, so this is a map uh, of, the, uh, of the Middle East uh, uh, as we know it today, uh, but really delineating the white part on the map uh, is the State of Israel within the uh, borders of 1949 armistice lines. So this is what things looked like at the end 
of the period we're going to be discussing today. Uh, and um, in terms of the psychology around this, this is very significant. Um, this is really an Israeli's view of uh, his or her neighborhood in 1949. Okay, uh, surrounded by uh, countries uh, that are opposed to it being there. That's one way of, uh, of mapping out this period. Um, here's another way of mapping out this era. Uh, and this uh, obviously is a later vantage point, takes it all the way up to the early 21st century. Um, but a Palestinian would tell you this is really the map that you should be exploring. Uh, that uh, look at the far left. Uh, and you will see the, the white area uh, is really all the land that was um, owned uh, and populated by Jews in 1946. And then subsequently over time, uh, land that was populated and owned by Palestinian Arabs, uh, or you can call them Palestinians, and there's a semantic issue that I'll get to later, um, that that eroded over time. And that, that's critical. In fact, that's the whole story, one could argue. Um, and that's, I think, an important way of understanding uh, this narrative. So what I'd like to do for you this evening is to break this into three components. One is to talk a little bit about essential background. I'm not going to go back to the very beginning of things. We really just don't have the time for that. Uh, but I'll give you what I think are the essential pieces. And, and please, uh, uh, if, if some of the things I say um, still leave you at a loss, feel free to ask me um, when we have the question and answer uh, session. Uh, two is to look at the actual uh, conflict um, when the bullets started flying, as it were. Uh, and then three, the legacy of this era uh, for uh, posterity um, and something we're still dealing with today. And the essential background, as I see it, is to one, look at a couple of fundamental premises, uh, then historically look at the end of the period of the British Mandate and the Second World War, to look at immediate post-war attitudes towards Palestine, and then look at the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine and some of the other committees that were taking a look at this part of the world. Uh, and I do apologize in advance if there's some assumed knowledge that I'm throwing in here. Uh, I, I hope uh, it doesn't get in the way, but I think we have a generally educated audience as we typically do here at Siegel Programs. Okay. Um, I think you can really break this down into two fundamental premises. Um, and one could say, we again, stop right here, end of story. You don't need to go much farther than this, similar to what I did with the maps. Um, but uh, these are really where you get the two parallel narratives from. Uh, you know, why uh, in, in trying to unpack two years of history in the same location, same piece of, uh, of territory on the, on the earth, uh, you have these two different stories that emerge. And because you have two different fundamental premises as to what's really going on here. Um, the Israeli narrative uh, goes from the perspective that Zionism was predicated on the belief that Jews had in the past and have still uh, the right to return to their ancient homeland and reconstitute themselves as a sovereign modern nation on the soil of their forefathers. You can agree with that. You cannot agree with it. I'm telling you this is the basic premise on which the state of Israel was created. Um, at the same time, the Arabs who were in Palestine then, uh, and we would call them Palestinians today, had um, no memory of any other homeland, viewed that land, the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, as their possession from both religious and ethnic perspectives, regardless of who exercised political authority, whether the Ottoman Turks were in charge, the British were in charge, or ultimately uh, Jews running the state of Israel were in charge, a Palestinian Arab will tell you uh, that that land is theirs. So you have these really um, clashing starting points from the very beginning. Uh, if we look at these older legacies, um, that's not always a consistent story, both under the Ottomans, uh, who ruled Palestine until essentially the end of the First World War, and the British who ruled Palestine until essentially the end of the Second World War, uh, give or take a few years. Uh, both of them wavered between encouraging and limiting Jewish immigration into Palestine. Um, neither of them really ever uh, led the, the, the native Palestinian population to believe that in any near future 
uh, they would be getting sovereignty on their own. It's an interesting piece of this. Uh, and over that time, dating back to really the beginning of the 20th century, the Jewish community in Palestine increased in, its Jew in, in self sufficiency. Um, and at the same time, and, and really this is most stark in the 1930s, uh, among the Arab population in Palestine, um, you had tremendous internal discord uh, and a loss of leadership, particularly the, the nationalists uh, who were, it seems, beginning uh, to agitate uh, towards their own national independence in the mid-1930s. Um, many were kicked out by the British, uh, some left uh, because of the disturbances during that period. Uh, and at the same time, the way that the, the British and the Ottomans before them ran things in Palestine uh, did not encourage local Arab Palestinian leadership um, to really take a, a serious role in, how, in governance. Right? I mean, things, things did uh, get controlled at the local level, uh, particularly in, in a very uh, um, traditional tribal fashion, uh, but you did not have a parallel development among the Palestinian Arab population the way you did in what was the Palestinian Jewish population. And I use those terms because prior to 1948, if you looked at a map, you would see Palestine. Uh, and if you held a passport from um, Jaffa, your passport would be Palestine, regardless of whether you're Jewish or, or Muslim or Christian. Uh, so Palestinian was the technically correct term uh, for anyone from that area uh, until 1948, uh, at which point uh, Jews and some Arabs began to call themselves Israelis, uh, and, um, and Arab Palestinians uh, who did not call themselves Israelis sometimes found themselves in a bit of limbo. Um, but uh, could, could uh, obtain Jordanian citizenship at other times as well. Another story for another time. Um, another piece of essential background from this period is what we can call the original two-state solution. There's so much discussion around the two-state solution, one-state solution. In 1937, the British government uh, proposed a two-state solution, what was known as the Peel Commission, uh, and a partition plan. Um, it was presumed, uh, we know this from, um, from diary entries and from um, reports from British ministers, though this was not part of the official report, it was presumed that the Arab state, what you see in purple here, would ultimately uh, be fused with Transjordan. Uh, and it was also presumed that over 300,000 Arabs from what would ultimately be the Jewish state on this map uh, would be relocated. Uh, onto Arab land either in what was Palestine or somewhere else in the Arab world. Uh, this plan was ultimately abandoned uh, by the British. It was rejected um, by um, Arab leadership. Uh, it was uh, accepted with reservations and um, limitations by Jewish leadership. But it all turned out to be irrelevant uh, in 1939 with the Second World War on the horizon. Uh, the British decided they would go in another direction. Um, and, um, and called for, uh, created what was called the White Paper in 1939, uh, which would limit subsequent Jewish immigration over a 10 year period to about 75,000 uh, and, um, uh, and, and eliminate further uh, sale of land uh, to, uh, to Jews. Uh, but soon after that, the Second World War broke out and really all bets were off then uh, and people were waiting to see what would unfold in the war. Um, the uh, Jewish leadership in Palestine, for obvious reasons, threw its lot in with the British and the other allies. Um, the Arab uh, countries didn't, uh, as a block, throw their lot in uh, with, um, with the Axis, though certainly there were some individuals who were prominently connected to the Axis. Uh, the most important one for our story being the Grand Mufti, Haj Amin al Husseini, uh, who had already been evicted from Palestine by the British uh, in the late 1930s, uh, was hanging out in Beirut uh, and decided that he would place his bets on the Germans. Um, he was wrong in that regard. Uh, another piece of critical uh, background for knowing why things happened the way they did uh, is the shadow of the Holocaust, which still you know, uh, finds its way into our narrative e even today. Uh, immediately at the end of the Second World War, even before the war ended, uh, there was news coming out daily from Europe. Um, the Jewish community in Palestine was almost entirely uh, of Eastern European descent, uh, with the exception of 
a small minority of families that were longtime uh, Palestinian uh, Jews. Um, and so there was direct connection to what was going on in that part of the world. Uh, and immediately after the war, when photos start to come out, you get this disturbing imagery. You have the emergence of these displaced person camps in Europe, which are a constant reminder of what had just happened. Um, and the issue of the Jewish community in Palestine uh, was really uh, quite visibly represented in those displaced person camps, convincing anyone that would listen to them, or trying to convince anyone that would listen to them, that what they need to tell anyone from the West who would ask them is that they want to go to Palestine and nowhere else. Um, the notion of German, and you could read into that broader Western responsibility, emerged from a very early stage. Um, Jewish leadership in Palestine was talking about this before the war ended, that when a peace conference comes, and it's going to come, so they thought, uh, we need to be at the table and try to get something for ourselves on the basis of the way Jews have suffered um, at the hands of other Western powers. Uh, other important elements to this story, uh, for the Jews in Palestine, the whole story of the Holocaust proved what they had been telling themselves and telling anyone who to listen to them uh, for the, the previous few decades, uh, that without a sovereign Jewish state, particularly in the land of Israel, this sort of thing would happen and continue to happen for the foreseeable future. Uh, this whole business around the connection of the Holocaust to the creation of Israel begs the question, um, which I'm not going to answer for you, uh, but does beg the question, if there was no Holocaust, uh, would there not be, uh, would there or would there not be a state of Israel uh, today? There is no consensus uh, on, uh, on this question. Um, Something else happening during this era uh, as the Second World War, uh, really at, at during the later stages of the war, uh, the Jewish community in Palestine starts to become uh, not militant, but militarized in the conventional sense. They're starting to, uh, to learn uh, because they have people who are placed in the active fighting forces. Over 25,000 Palestinian Jews uh, join uh, the allies on the British side. Um, Within the Jewish community of Palestine itself, you have the establishment uh, of some uh, elite brigades. The Palmach, which is the, the shock troops, uh, were established in 1941. Um, and by 1942, uh, the underground, uh, which was really a poorly kept secret underground, uh, the Jewish Defense Force in Palestine, the Haganah, um, had over 30,000 members with arms for, for over half of them. You have smaller militant groups established uh, early on in, in the war. Uh, and in 1944, uh, the revisionist uh, right-wing uh, group, the Irgun, the IZL, the Irgun Sva'ilim Li'umi, uh, which is the, the organization, the, the military organiza national military organization, uh, announced that they would resume the struggle to liberate Palestine, meaning to liberate Palestine from the British not to liberate Palestine from anyone else. Um, and they had put that mission on hiatus uh, for the previous five years during the Second World War. Why is all of this important? Uh, is that when we get to the question of what things looked like uh, in 1947, 48, um, the numbers only tell a bit of the story. Uh, and getting some qualitative assessment of uh, what type of preparation had occurred within the Jewish community of Palestine compared to the Arab community in Palestine is critical for understanding why things played out ultimately uh, the way that they did. Um, again, put some questions to you, and, and I'll throw out uh, some possibilities as to what the world thought. I really don't know what anybody thought, but we can make some assumptions uh, based on uh, what some of the diplomats were saying at the time uh, about Palestine after the Second World War. Uh, the British, who were still in charge, um, they were ready to be done with it, uh, particularly uh, when so-called uh, Jewish terrorist activity picked up again immediately after the Second World War, uh, and British soldiers and installations were being targeted, uh, and they're coming off uh, tremendous loss of manpower during the Second World War. Um, it's a hard sell to convince people back home that their young, um, you know, that their uh, uh, sons and husbands should be dying for Palestine. Um, it's so fascinating how these stories really just never go away. Um, but that's a legitimate question. Uh, what do the United States, States think? The United States wanted to see some place for Jewish survivors of the Holocaust to go that would not be New York. Um, and they're quite adamant about this. Uh, the um, American 
uh, leadership uh, calls, the President Truman calls for the immediate immigration, opening the doors of Palestine to 100,000 Jewish uh, refugees from, uh, from Europe. Um, and of course, the question is, why send them to Palestine? Um, there was no, no uh, desire on the part of Jews in America as well to bring them en masse to the United States. Uh, the Soviet Union being the other major player uh, at that time uh, sort of shocked much of the world by taking the position that ultimately they were going to support uh, the creation of a Jewish state in, um, somewhere in Palestine. Um, and largely, we tend to think, uh, people who study this, uh, that they were just happy to get the British colonialist model out of that part of the world and at least roll the dice a bit. Uh, the notion that they really felt that the, the socialist Jewish leadership of Palestine uh, would, would be on board with their understanding, their worldview, there's not much evidence to support that. Um, there's no indication that David Ben-Gurion, who ultimately runs things uh, in Israel, uh, really was leaning any way other than, um, than getting closer to the United States. Uh, but the Soviets seemed to be happy to make things difficult uh, for the British. Uh, and uh, the, the surrounding Arab world, uh, the Arab League, which had emerged right after the Second World War, uh, this was a problem for them. Um, the, the Palestine question was on the one hand a unifying force for them in that they clearly were anti-Zionist. Um, the Arab countries did not want to see a Jewish state emerge in Palestine, but they also had no idea really what they wanted to see uh, show up there. Um, there was no recognized Palestinian leadership. There was no voice that was speaking for the Arab population of Palestine that was recognized by the rest of the Arab countries. There were plenty of people who wanted uh, that opportunity and wanted that position, uh, particularly the Grand Mufti, again, who spent most of his time uh, in Egypt, uh, but he wasn't getting, he, he really wasn't getting permission uh, to behave that way. Uh, most of the Arab world seemed more terrified of what it might mean for him to return to Palestine um, than, um, you know, than to leave him out of the picture. Uh, and so this all sets up the situation for the United Nations to come in um, with their special committee on Palestine, which is set up to research and report what's going on in this part of the world. There are 11 delegates from the countries I have listed on the slide. Uh, the Arab Higher Committee, which was claiming to be the representative body uh, of the Palestinian uh, Arab population, boycotted the committee. Um, there, the the uh, Jews, on the other hand, the Jews in Palestine prepared very well for this visit, uh, including some excellent uh, public relations displays, uh, most notably the arrival of the Exodus 1947, uh, fresh from Europe, uh, and they couldn't have written it better themselves when the British decided to turn the ship around and send it back to Germany of all places. So this was great uh, PR and propaganda for the Zionist leadership. There's some debate to what extent this was clearly intentional um, or the timing just worked out and that was when the ship was gonna sail. I tend to think that it was orchestrated pretty well. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, the committee, as we know, decides on, some, on this partition scheme, which I'll talk about in a minute. But there's no real plan in place as to how to get there. Uh, so the committee decides to, to uh, impose a two-state solution uh, to recommend splitting the land between uh, the Jews and the Arabs with the intention of creating an independent Jewish state uh, and an independent Arab state. At least that's what the uh, report says, uh, again, without any instructions of how one would actually get there. Uh, and then there is a big scramble behind the scenes to try to line up votes. Um, uh, Jewish leadership, both in Palestine and around the world, uh, is trying to line up support uh, for the partition plan, which ultimately was approved by the General Assembly in November 1947. So that is all my background material. Um, and now we're going to get uh, into the period uh, 1947 through 1949. Um, so take a breath here. And these are just a couple of uh, points that I, I, that I want to cover to help us get through the first phase of the fighting. Um, the partition resolution is accepted by the United Nations in November 1947. The fighting begins then. Um, in May of 1948, the British leave Palestine and the fighting continues then, but it changes drastically. 
Uh, and I'd like to look at a little bit of the rhetoric, what people were saying, what things actually looked like on the ground, um, how things played out in terms of the back and forth. You have two phases here, uh, a word about what was going on in Jerusalem, uh, and then a moment on the story of Deir Yassin, which I will explain for those of you who have never heard of that place. Uh, what were people saying and thinking about this partition scheme? In the middle of September 1947, so this is before uh, the partition plan is approved, uh, the Arab League promised military and financial assistance to the Palestinian Arabs to fight partition. Now this is very important, just again, for the rhetoric that is flying and for understanding the psychology of all of the players involved. We may not know what their true intentions were, but this is at least what people were saying publicly. And the Arab League means the big players in the region, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, saying publicly that they will provide assistance to fight partition, which means if you are hearing that from the Palestinian Arab side, help is on the way, or from the Jewish side, we're in trouble. Right? And, and that's, again, part of the, the psychology is extremely important. Publicly, the Zionist leadership called for equality with all the Arabs in the new state that would eventually come into being in all areas except for immigration. Um, that immigration would be unlimited as far as Jews are concerned, um, but there was really no mention of immigration beyond that, but everybody knew what it meant. Um, and again, there, there, you can debate what people said in private, and we have some indications of what people were thinking, uh, but at least in terms of what was said out in the public, this becomes part of the story. Uh, and we don't know what they were thinking, but, but actions mean something, uh, in that the Palestinian urban leadership and middle class uh, started to leave um, right after the partition uh, vote is announced. They had the means, right? They could buy a ticket to go somewhere else, uh, they could pack up their family. Um, their goal was to wait it out, right? They had done this sort of thing before. Many have left in the 1930s, and you come back. Who wants to sit around in a war zone if you can avoid that? Um, so that's what people were saying. Uh, and then you have this question of, okay, what, what did things really look like on the ground beyond the rhetoric? What was the reality of what was going to ultimately happen uh, as opposed to the, uh, to the perceptions? Um, how many fighting uh, men, really, this we're talking about, there were some women certainly who fought on the Jewish side, but it's for the most part men, um, do, do each of these, uh, the parties to the conflict, have at their disposal? What type of weaponry did they have? How organized were they? Um, what resources are available to them? What type of international support backing them up? The British are still there in November 1947 for a, a good uh, uh, six months. Uh, so what are they doing inside Palestine, and what are they telling uh, other Arab leaders? Um, if we look at the lay of the land, uh, this is what you get. Uh, that um, even in the land that was allocated to the Jewish state, right, which is more or less the contours of what uh, Israel um, prior to 1967 looked like. They conquered more territory, but the general shape uh, was the same. Um, in that territory, in 1947, hundreds of thousands of Arabs were still living uh, in that land. Uh, the Jews had, had relatively limited access to weaponry, arms. Uh, the borders, while the British were still in charge, were still effectively closed, right? So they couldn't bring large numbers of, uh, of immigrants in. Uh, some of these Jewish settlements, you look at the, the, the orange areas on the map, uh, are really isolated posts. So, you know, farms with a couple of hundred people um, many, many miles away uh, from civilization, as they say. Uh, the other lay of the land, but again, um, you know, contrasting in, in the Palestinian population is whatever leadership there is, uh, is not in Palestine. Um, a few cities which will become important to our story, which had mixed Jewish and Arab populations, um, existed, uh, primarily Jerusalem, Safat, Tiberias, Haifa, and Jaffa. Uh, if you were trying to figure out the way things are going to go, right, so if you're a betting person, uh, you would probably try to look at this sort of stuff. Uh, and say, um, okay, you know, how, how is this all going to play out? Um, the British are going to leave. Uh, the bullets are already flying. What are things going to look like over time? Well, at least initially, uh, it looked something like this. Uh, the, the Arab population of Palestine we're talking about here, not the surrounding countries, um, was contiguous with some sort of external supply chain. 
there was a land crossing between Palestine and the surrounding Arab countries where material could come through. The, board, the land border was relatively porous for the Arab population. Um, the, the water border was not so much as that was really patrolled by the British, uh, and that was of more interest to the Jewish population. There were about 650,000 Jews compared to 1.3 million Arabs, and again, uh, this is in the area of Mandate Palestine. Uh, and typically, the Arab population held the high ground, specifically in the areas uh, that, uh, that would be the West Bank uh, today. Uh, the advantages on the Jewish side, uh, and you know, all of this is, is a compare and contrast, so these are advantages compared to what was the case uh, among the Palestinian Arab population. Uh, the Jews had tremendous organizational structure and discipline. They basically had a state ready to go. Uh, they had all the trappings, and, and specifically in the military area, they were working behind the scenes, um, so the day that the British left, they would be ready. Um, arguably, they were much more motivated. Uh, they were more unified. There was a higher uh, you know, a sense of morale uh, among uh, the Jewish population of Palestine. Uh, this notion uh, that it was all or nothing um, was, was quite dominant. Uh, and qualitatively, uh, I guess in, in, in terms of fighting, um, fighting personnel, uh, you could argue there was a significant advantage. Those 20,000 plus people who had fought in the Second World War were seasoned soldiers who knew how to, how to fire up-to-date weaponry, uh, who knew um, what chain of command was. Uh, this was really non-existent uh, within the Arab population of Palestine. Uh, and they had tremendous economic resources at disposal, specifically the Jewish community of the United States, but those in other countries as well, that immediately um, after the partition uh, plan was approved by the United Nations, uh, there was an outpouring of economic support. Uh, the story is uh, that uh, they sent uh, gold to my ear to the United States uh, to raise something like $25 million, and she came back with 50. Uh, and then three months later, they sent her out again and, and the same thing. Um, and there was no analogous apparatus uh, in, uh, in the uh, Palestinian uh, Arab world. So when the bullets start flying, it looks something like this. Uh, early on, um, most of the action was in Jewish-held territory, uh, that particularly on the roads. These were relatively easy targets. Um, the British were still there. Right? So the type of, uh, of real um, conventional warfare, conventional combat, was not going to happen while the British were still around. Um, they made it explicit uh, that while they understood that things could get a little messy, they did not want to, to see a full-scale war break out, and that particularly if, if there was any intervention from the outside, uh, they would step in. Um, but the, the, Jewish, uh, pop, the Jewish communities had some relatively isolated um, outposts, uh, if you want to call Jerusalem an outpost, uh, and the transit routes uh, were often blocked. Uh, you didn't have the, the situation where there were well-defined front lines. Uh, there, there was a, a bit of guerrilla warfare uh, going on. Uh, but uh, importantly for subsequent uh, elements of the story, during this early stage, um, first four or five months, uh, about 100,000 Arabs evacuate. Uh, and now these early evacuations, and this will contrast to some of the things I will say about what happened later, um, do not appear to have been forced expulsions. There is no evidence that in this early period the Arabs were forcibly driven out by Jews. Uh, mostly they left to escape the fighting, right? Um, that again, uh, you know, you, you, you pick up, you relocate to somewhere a little quieter with the intention of returning um, when things quiet down. In April of 1948, and this is really because you're getting close, closer and closer to the British withdrawal, so there's no one really policing uh, the store anymore as you get closer to May, um, things start to change a little bit. Uh, the Jews in Palestine start to behave uh, more offensively in terms of their actions uh, towards the local uh, uh, Arab population. There's a concern that the United Nations may back out um, that, the, uh, that the United States in particular was pressuring uh, the powers that be to postpone um, the actual implementation of partition. Uh, Jerusalem was essentially under siege. 
Uh, and really, all of these, both these two factors, plus the arrival of some arms from Czechoslovakia, encouraged the Jewish forces to become more aggressive uh, in, um, uh, in how they were going to pursue this war. Uh, and an important element of this, again, going back to the rhetoric, is the presumption, which turned out to be correct, but the presumption that as soon as the British leave, that everything was going to shift because the, the Arab armies would no longer be native to Palestine, but the fighting forces would be coming in from the outside. So there was a clear intentionality on the part of Jewish leadership to try to establish um, lines of communication, you can call them facts on the ground, um, to, to, to have some defensible lines when the British pulled out. So everybody's trying to maneuver uh, and figure out what things are going to look like as soon as, as, soon as the British uh, get out. Um, but it does seem to be the case uh, that the, the Jews in Palestine, anyway, uh, read things a little bit more clearly uh, as to what was likely to occur. Uh, and that the Arabs in Palestine, and again, there was no real unified leadership um, and, uh, and didn't have a plan other than the expectation that help is on the way. Um, and this is something that's been problematic uh, for the Palestinian community um, since then. The cities that had mixed populations of Jews and Arabs are an interesting story. Um, by the time the British pulled out, and, and these are you know, significant populations, uh, Haifa had uh, 72 to 75,000 Arabs um, in 1947. When the British leave in May of 1948, around 67,000 had left from Haifa, and a similar number had left Jaffa. Uh, now, these were cities that where they didn't necessarily live side by side, Arabs and Jews. You had different neighborhoods. Uh, but the, you know, there was a, a, a modus vivendi, a way of getting along uh, for people uh, that hadn't necessarily broken down. Um, and even as the, the fighting was going on, uh, everyone knew that most of the civilian population was not directly involved in the conflict. But one of the British policies during this period uh, was to try to figure out the best way to avoid the most bloodshed. And they encouraged the minority population or the population that they thought was most at risk to leave. Now, when they encouraged Jewish populations to leave, typically they did not leave because their argument was that they had nowhere to go. Um, when they would encourage the Arab populations to leave, at least at, during this phase, um, they started to leave. Now, there are some ups and downs, particularly after uh, uh, what happened in early April in Deir Yassin outside Jerusalem, um, that impacts the story in these other cities. Uh, but there are some interesting um, anecdotes coming out of this era uh, where you know, the civil leadership, uh, the, the municipality, the mayors, and, and together with the, the British military authorities uh, tried to figure out ways of, uh, uh, of allowing people to stay. Um, but most of them left. But again, we have no expectation that they felt this was a permanent departure. Uh, that most of the people who fled had every expectation of coming back. They had a sense of property. They had a sense uh, of um, their own notion of patriotism, that this was their home and that they belonged. Um, so they didn't know that, that the departure uh, was, was going to be essentially permanent. Uh, and then in the cities of Tzfat and Tiberias, which had smaller populations than, than Haifa and Jaffa, uh, by May 1948, uh, they're basically entirely empty of their Arab populations. Um, so you can start ticking the numbers down here. Around 100,000 had left uh, in the first phase of the war. Um, you have uh, another 150,000 or so leaving. Rel you know, as far as we know, um, you know, I, hate to, I hesitate to use the word voluntarily with all that that implies because this is war. Um, you know, it's not a pleasant situation, but they felt they'd be safe for getting out of Dodge, so they did. Uh, and um, so, you know, you have a, a little over a quarter million people living more or leaving more or less uh, voluntarily. Then we'll get to those that did not. Um, in the Jewish settlements, to the contrary, uh, they had orders from their central command. Uh, essentially to hold the fort, not to fight to the last man, woman, or child. In many cases, the women and children were evacuated um, when, when possible. Uh, and there are some cases where those were the orders that were given 
uh, against really ridiculous odds, and the people on the ground made decisions to evacuate and to try to get out. That was rare, uh, but it happened. Uh, and they adopt a policy beginning in, of eight, in April uh, that when attacked, they would counterattack uh, and use some language that we're familiar with today with disproportionate strength um, against the villages that mounted the assaults against them. So this, you know, doesn't begin. It really began in, in, in November, or, or you could say even earlier in this era, when the, you know, even in the 1920s. But it's the back and forth. It's the cycle of violence uh, that, in order to show strength and save face and all the things that are involved with that, uh, you don't just hit back. You hit back harder to prevent uh, a, a recurrence of, of what befell you before. Uh, and just a word about what was going on in Jerusalem, which had already been a divided city. Uh, there was already an East Jerusalem and a West Jerusalem. Um, although you had some population outposts uh, on either side, there were Arab villages in what's subsequently West Jerusalem today, uh, places like Baca and Katamon. Uh, and um, you had Jews living in what was, uh, you know, uh, East Jerusalem, uh, specifically the um, those at Hebrew University and Hadassah Hospital on Mount Scopus. Uh, but uh, because of its location and its distance and isolation from the majority uh, uh, Jewish communities closer to the coast, um, most of the Jewish population was on the verge of starvation by early March. Another reason why the Jewish leadership made the decision to become uh, more offensive, uh, because taking the defensive posture was really not working for them. Um, this all seems to come to a head, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I will talk about atrocities the other way as well. Um, but the psychology of what goes on in this part of the world is extremely important. The psychology up until that time uh, had been uh, that at least in, in terms of their you know, public persona, the Jews were making the case uh, that they were following the rules of war uh, and that atrocities, when they occurred, were committed uh, by their Arab enemies, their Arab opponents. Uh, and April 9th, uh, that seems to no longer be the case uh, when a small village really on, on this road to Jerusalem, so there's a uh, strategic reason why the village was attacked. Uh, ultimately, that attack uh, leads to a massacre uh, of, of some non-combatants. Um, and the surviving inhabitants uh, of that village, of that Arab village, are forcibly removed uh, from the village. This is really um, the first example uh, of, of an implementation of what was not yet, certainly the massacre was never policy, but the depopulation of Arab villages did ultimately become policy in some places. So we have to ask, you know, why, um, th what's the logic behind that? Uh, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is actually to so fear in the local population uh, that one egregious violation of the rules of war can go a long way in making things much easier for you. Uh, secondly, uh, there is no indication at all uh, that central command, uh, central uh, uh, Jewish command, uh, had a hand in this, uh, but there's also no indication that they were totally ignorant uh, of what was going on. Uh, as a little bit, uh, a little bit of each. Uh, and if you look at the legacy um, of this episode, and this is a, a quote uh, from quotation of Menachem Begin, um, who wasn't personally involved but uh, was connected uh, to this episode, uh, that the. You know, writing how ultimately this benefited uh, the Jews, writing that the enemy propaganda was designed to besmirch our name. So this was supposed to work against uh, the Jews, and the result, it helped them. Panic overwhelmed the Arabs of Eretz Yisrael. A Colonia village, which had previously repulsed every attack, was evacuated overnight and fell without further fight fighting. Beit Ixa was also evacuated. These two places overlooked the main road, and their fall, together with the capture of Al Qastal, made it possible to keep open the road to Jerusalem. Uh, the rest of the country, the Arabs began to flee in terror even before they clashed with Jewish forces. So, not what happened at Deir Yassin, but what was invented about Deir Yassin, according to Begin, helped to carve the way to our decisive victories on the battlefield. The legend was worth half a dozen battalions to the forces of Israel. And what's interesting about this, he seems to get it right in terms of the propaganda value, is that in subsequent battles, you would have Arab leadership telling their population, remember Deir Yassin, and you would have the Jews coming in telling them, remember Deir Yassin, because that would convince people to leave uh, and to get out of town. 
um, and try to prevent fighting. So arguably, uh, there's, there's a logic behind this. Um, and you know, something that, again, you, you have to understand, and it doesn't you know, legitimize this sort of behavior. We have examples of similar activities, um, you know, brutal uh, massacres uh, on the part of some of the Palestinian militants as well. Uh, but the objective that is starting to come into play um, from the Jewish perspective is defensible lines for the conflict that's about to come, that this is a war that is a war to the death. And the reason that it is a war to death is because that's the way that it has been proclaimed by our adversaries. That's what, uh, what Begin would have said, and I think also what Ben-Gurion would have said at that time. Um, so what you start seeing happen here at the same time that the British leave is that organized Arab society, as whatever organization there was, really begins to collapse. Um, the Jewish population is starting to switch gears from this guerrilla war, war to start to prepare for this conventional war. Um, and the Arab countries on the outside really, really, if you ask them, didn't want to get in. Um, they would have preferred to stay out. Right? The people that are making these decisions, even though you could look back at them today and say how idiotic, these are not stupid people, right? particularly the military commanders. They know that they're not getting into a situation that's going to be good for them. But they really have, feel like they have no choice. Right? Um, and one of the things that happens here is that's also why the Palestinian leadership is totally ostracized. Because the external leadership, the other Arab countries, knew that the Mufti and people like him were also going to fight to the end. Uh, and that no sort of agreement, truce, armistice uh, would ever be, uh, be reached with them. Uh, and the way the British understand this uh, is that the tide really started to turn. Right? So you know, you're starting to set the stage, at least for people that are paying keen attention, um, that this isn't necessarily going to be the route that a lot of people thought it would be uh, of, of um, you know, hundreds of thousands of Arab soldiers coming in from the outside uh, and eliminating this fledgling Jewish state, uh, that at least inside on the ground in Palestine, uh, Arab morale was really down um, and that people were leaving in the thousands and that they really needed the outside uh, armies to come in uh, and help them out. Uh, again, trying to understand the psychology. What were people thinking and then why did they do what they do? Uh, the Israelis um, felt that they were in a precarious situation if they didn't really continue to act offensively, uh, that their isolated areas uh, were being targeted and massacred. Um, there was a convoy going from West Jerusalem to Mount Scopus, civilian convoy, uh, which really nasty situation that was viewed as payback for Deir Yassin. Um, you had their settlements outside of Jerusalem and Gush Etzion, uh, which also suffered. Uh, and you also have this ongoing psychology of victimization on the part of the Jews in Palestine, um, seeing themselves as a population that had suffered through the 1930s, that the Holocaust was still very close, deeply etched in their memory, even if they were not actual survivors themselves. Survivors are starting to come in, and this is a significant impact on the psychology of, uh, of Israelis. And the broad propaganda that's out there from the Arab-speaking world, whether it's in Palestine or on the outside, that's saying that they're not going to allow this partition plan uh, to unfold uh, successfully. So the propaganda is out there. In terms of the psychology of the Palestinians, this example of Deir Yassin starts to tell people um, that this is not a very safe place. Uh, you had a lot of leadership had already left. So for other people to leave, they're following in their footsteps. Uh, and there's really nobody on the ground trying to keep people together uh, and convince them, convince them to stay. And they're no longer party to the conflict. Right? They don't really have an active role from this point in, both in the fight and then subsequently in the diplomacy. It's really, you know, in that respect, tragic uh, you know, from the Palestinian nationalist perspective. Uh, but they're, they're lost. This is the situation in which they found themselves. Uh, within the Arab states, you have a street population that's saying, we got to go get them, liberate Palestine, remember Deir and all of these things, uh, and a leadership that is saying, this doesn't look good. Um, and they're being advised, uh, particularly in Jordan, where they have very strong connections to the British government and British army, saying, this doesn't look good. You've got to be careful. Um, the Israelis, as part of their shifting of gears in the changing landscape, 
um, uh, begin to implement uh, what they call Plan D or Tochnit Dalet. Um, this is possible because of large scale weapon shipments uh, that are starting to arrive. Uh, even though there was an embargo that was pretty strictly held in, in official terms, uh, the Jews found ways to bring weaponry in, uh, whereas the, the Palestinians really did not get resupplied effectively. Um, and they changed their attitude really from the, the, the mode of holding your ground uh, to conquering territory in order to secure borders uh, against the enemy that's going to be coming in from the outside. Um, and you see the beginning of strategic, strategic elimination of some Arab villages, uh, largely for what, what they believed to be the case. And I think you have to uh, accept that there was a genuine belief that this would be true, uh, that indigenous Arabs who remained within Israel would represent a threat ultimately to the security of this new state. Uh, one can debate whether that would have been true or not, uh, but I think it is a legitimate um, conclusion for some of the Jewish leadership to reach, um, aside from the general demographic scenario, which we can discuss uh, as well, uh, but from a security perspective, uh, allowing these Arab villages, many of which, even if they weren't directly involved in fighting, had given quarter uh, to those who were involved in fighting was a dangerous prospect. Um, and again, how it was done varied place to place. There are many examples of ways of uh, cases where it was certainly not uh, done pleasantly, uh, but the strategy behind it is logical, if nothing else. Uh, and, um, and really hoping to have things in place for the moment the British leave. Um, and yes, uh, this led to the expulsion uh, of additional hundreds of thousands of Arabs. Um, when the Arabs invade uh, Israel uh, or Palestine, it's really not so much Israel proper, but Palestine itself, they have the advantage of first strike, they potentially have larger reserves, and they're fighting on enemy ter territory. There's, there's, there's a lot um, that seems to be going their way, uh, but ultimately, if you line things up, um, the, the Jewish forces seem to have, um, uh, have better resources at their disposal, better fighting forces, uh, better motivation, better communication lines. Just one example of this, uh, I don't have the big map up here, but the Egyptian army that came in rolled all the way across the desert, all the way through the Sinai to try to get involved in the fighting. They had never done this sort of thing before. They had no, the, the, the military leadership had no idea what it would mean to try to maintain a supply line of food and water and medical supplies and ammunition all the way from the Suez Canal into the Negev. Um, whereas the Jewish forces really didn't have to worry about those types of extended supply lines. Um, and even though things initially looked on the numbers uh, you know, to be in favor of the Arab leadership, um, we'll see that uh, that, that changes. Um, as I said earlier, the Palestinian leadership continues to be removed uh, from the equation. Uh, there's an expectation that the UN will get involved. Really, the United States, uh, through Jewish lobbying, um, prevents that from happening. Uh, and the uh, what was arguably the most effective fighting force on the Arab side, uh, the Jordanian uh, Arab Legion, British trained, um, refused to do anything uh, prior to May 15th. Uh, and it seems to be the case, there's really not 100% agreement on this, seems to be the case that there was an understanding all along between the British, the Jordanians, and the Israelis that the Jordanians would fight to retain land in the West Bank that had been allocated to the Arab state and would not go further at least would not go further if not provoked. Um, and, and I think there's good reason to, uh, to support that conclusion. Uh, Lebanon, which was initially supposed to be party to this, uh, really didn't fight at all. Uh, the Iraqis, who were probably the most bellicose in their rhetoric, uh, sent a token force of 1,500. You can start to see the facade um, of Arab strength with respect to fighting in Palestine start to collapse. Uh, and though in the first weeks, um, you see a, a fair amount of success on the Arab side. Um, these long supply lines, a shortage of ammunition, uh, and, and really a lack of central command uh, and central strategy uh, made things very, very difficult, and Ben-Gurion even noted. Uh, and this is after only about a month of fighting. Uh, he writes that the Arabs are close to the end um, and that the, the fighting can, would be concluded relatively quickly. Um,
Jewish resources, on the other hand, are also stretched thin. So when we do see a truce, that's one of the reasons that they want it. Uh, fighting forces are starting to, to turn into casualties. Uh, they are not equipped to sustain a, a long war because this is the, the civilian population now that is, engaged, uh, that is engaged in the conflict. And the Arab invasion from the outside, if we get back to the story of the Palestinian refugees, uh, really, if anything, only exacerbated uh, the issue because it just made the, you know, literally the whole place a war zone. Um, and uh, it's only in October, um, so that's after a few months already, that you see a concerted effort on the part of some Arab leadership to try to convince people to stay and not leave, a recognition that this is not going to turn out the way that some people had intended, and there is the very real possibility that people who left won't be able to come back. And by that point, it really was too late. Um, and so you start to see, just in the, in the span of a couple of months, uh, the, the numbers, um, the quantitative assessment of this conflict uh, fall in favor of the Jewish forces. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, again, always I want to return to what people were thinking, uh, or at least how, what, we, what we might find ourselves thinking had we been in that situation. Uh, if you were an Israeli, a Jewish uh, uh, former citizen of Palestine, now an Israeli, you probably did not distinguish between a Palestinian Arab um, who lived in a village down the road and the Arabs coming in from other countries, right? Um, it was a distinction without a difference as far as they were concerned. Um, the rhetoric coming was the same. The intentionality was to, as far as the Israelis were concerned, was to eliminate the Jewish state. Uh, so um, there's a logic behind this notion of a fifth column. There's a logic behind uh, removing what is viewed to be a, a threatful, uh, a, a population that will be a threat. Uh, if you are a Palestinian, um, you got really nowhere to go, nowhere to run, um, and you're probably pretty scared as to how this is, this is all going to play out because uh, you're not getting much communication, right? Nobody's really talking to you. Uh, the Arab states on the outside are really stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, they're not in a position to totally call things off. There's all sorts of reasons for that, saving face being a big one, um, political considerations at home, um, making good on threats uh, that you've put out there. Uh, most of the other countries in the world, while they wanted to see the fighting stop, were willing to let it play out, uh, which, is, which is really ultimately what happened. Um, and this is just a quotation from a, a recent Israeli historian uh, on, on the Arab military. Um, and and re the reason that you see some of this historiography is he's trying to dispel the David versus Goliath myth, right? This notion that the Jews were this tiny, uh, isolated entity that fought against tremendous outside forces. He's saying, even, you know, if you were looking that even at back then, and you're trying to make a, a legitimate strategic assessment, uh, you may come up with something like this, that the Arab coalition was divided, disorganized, um, and really was not an effective fighting force. Um, here you see some interesting um, two sides of, uh, of the coin from David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, uh, who, who says publicly, um, and I don't think you have any reason to doubt him from a civic perspective, that an Arab has the right to be elected president of the state if he's chosen for this role, all in favor of representative democracy. But at the same time, writes in his diary, we must do everything to ensure that the Palestinian refugees never do return. Right? Now, why does he say that? Right? And, and I don't think you reach the conclusion he says this because he's a racist. Right? He says this because he's concerned about Jewish sovereignty and ultimately the Jewish character and security um, of this new state that he's laid so much on the line to create. Um, he may be a racist. I mean, I, you know, you could maybe find other uh, indications of that. Uh, but the logic behind this notion of preventing the return of Palestinian refugees uh, is not about um, a, you know, a superior people versus an inferior people. Uh, it is an attempt to ensure survival, both from a military perspective and a demographic perspective. And certainly, I think we can talk about that a bit uh, after dinner. Um, so you have a truce, uh, and you know there, there's this gap between what the Arabs had stated they were going to do and really what they were able to do. Uh, could they admit failure and accept Jewish statehood? Um, the British pressured for a long truce. The Jews, why did they accept the truce? 
they needed to really resupply. They needed to restock. Um, this truce was much more effective uh, for, for the Jews than for the Arabs uh, in that regard. The Arabs had a very hard time resupplying. The embargo uh, really worked uh, against the Arabs. The Jews found ways through underground uh, um, uh, modalities. Um, you know, the not so secret arms shipments that left Brooklyn, uh, for example, uh, went a long way to helping the Jewish fighting forces. And there was simply nothing analogous uh, going on um, on the Arab side. Uh, and uh, you know, this led to subsequent, uh, subsequent truces. Uh, during the second truce, you really start to see these large-scale expulsions of uh, Palestinian populations, most notably uh, from, these are, these are not little villages, uh, from Lida and Ramla uh, in, uh, in Israel uh, of about 60,000 Arabs who are really marched out at the point of a gun and, and told not to come back. Um, why? Why? Because there was fear that, that this represented an ultimate threat um, that needed to be removed. These people are not killed. Right? These people are not massacred en masse, uh, but they're marched out with whatever property they can take, uh, they can take along with them. Uh, and to wrap this up, you do have a final ceasefire in January uh, of 1949, uh, and the refugee crisis uh, continues really down to this day as we know. Um, and one of the reasons that the crisis persists, that the refugee crisis persists, uh, is, is because there was an expectation on the part of Israeli leadership that the diplomacy at the end of the conflict would actually lead to peace agreements. Um, and that through bilateral negotiations, you would have bilateral peace agreements with each of the combatants. Um, and it looked like, at least with Jordan and maybe even with Egypt, uh, this would be possible. Um, when the Israelis went back on the offensive during the second truce in October, uh, I think really for, for uh, political reasons at home, neither of these countries could then forge an independent peace uh, with Israel. Um, the United Nations believed that the Arab countries would be more responsive uh, if a, with a UN-mediated multilateral uh, agreement um, that was somehow imposed from the outside. They could save face at home that way. Um, and so in order to get something moving quickly, the United Nations pushed for armistice agreements and not a full-blown uh, peace settlement. And just a couple more things to, to run through here. Um, what did any of this solve? So when the agreements are reached in 1949 for people to lay down their weapons, right, did it end the conflict? We know it did not end the conflict. Uh, the border skirmishes uh, remained endemic. Uh, you had a lot of small-scale uh, violence and occasional war, as we know, in subsequent decades. But at least for the people who were you know, engaged in the conflict, it allowed them to demobilize um, and then lead to some sort of stable situation. And this is not just the Israelis who benefited. Uh, you know, the, the Egyptians and the Jordanians in particular um, were very happy to, to stop the, uh, the conventional fighting. Um, so stable, a stable situation allowed everyone to retreat from a full-on war footing. And, um, you know, but for the Palestinians, uh, certainly this did not uh, have any good resolution uh, for them. Uh, the Israeli government from then, and really one could argue until now, argued that Palestinian, the status of Palestinian refugees could only be addressed in a full peace agreement which recognized the borders and sovereignty uh, of the Jewish state of Israel. That was in 1949. Has not happened since then. Uh, in Israel itself, uh, Arab Israelis were granted citizenship, but lived under essentially military occupation jurisdiction until 1965, um, and were generally treated as second-class citizens in some respects. Uh, that is still true. Uh, that uh, um, Palestinian Israelis really do not enjoy the same access uh, to services, to goods and services, um, as Jewish Israelis do, although I would argue that Palestinian Israelis certainly enjoy more access to goods and services than the Palestinians in other countries or than, than is generally a higher standard of living than, the, than most of the Arab populations in surrounding countries. Um, but you know, you could debate whether that means anything uh, to people on the ground. Um, clearly, this is a situation that has continued to fester uh, and leaves us you know, with this question of the legacy. Um, you know, for Israel, this legacy of Atzma'ud of independence is not only independence. There was a tremendous jolt of confidence. Uh, 
uh, that it was recognized by everyone uh, on the outside, um, you know, people in the region, people outside the region, uh, raised the status of Israel in the eyes of people around the world uh, and created the framework for continued growth, uh, immigration on a tremendously uh, un unheard of scale uh, and economic development that has led uh, really to a high standard of living uh, in that part of the world. Uh, for the legacy of 1948 for Palestinians remains uh, that of catastrophe, of Nakba. Uh, and this, this legacy has impacted not only the Palestinians, uh, but other Arab countries and certainly has impacted uh, the way that, uh, that other countries have subsequently viewed Israel really in more recent decades. So it wasn't the case early on. Um, the fact that there was no two-state solution early on even after the map emerged the way you see it here, the white area is not Palestine. It was annexed and governed by Jordan. Right? So there was no independent Palestinian entity um, subsequent to the fighting. Um, and, and you know, that's, that's a difficulty that, that, uh, that cast a long shadow. But the whole notion of catastrophe has been critical to the emergence of Palestinian national identity. Um, now, it's interesting, you know, when you talk about what could have been and maybe what should have been done, uh, there was no absorption of these Palestinian refugees by the surrounding Arab countries. It's really, you know, a fascinating um, history uh, because that probably could have been done with relative ease. Um, but had that been the case, the notion of what it means to be a Palestinian would be very different than it is today. Uh, and really, you know, the real shadow of all of this is the difficulty in, um, in reaching a broader Middle East peace uh, because the rest of the world actually st still views this region in many ways as, as, stuck, as stuck in 1949, um, that this initial conflict still hasn't been resolved. Uh, and, you know, perceptions, you know, have they changed over time? You know, I, I really leave that, that for everyone to judge. Um, you know, the historiography today is very different than it was 20 years ago. Uh, and um, the politics that we have today uh, around, uh, around these issues uh, is very different than it was 20 years ago. Uh, and, and one thing, you know, just uh, worth saying regarding where, where I get my history from, um, you know, and the materials that we have access to, uh, there were a, there's an enormous amount of archival material that's been opened from Israeli and British sources that shed a great amount of light on this era. Uh, to this day, you do not have governmental archival material uh, from the combating Arab states as part of this conflict. There are newspaper reports, and once in a while you'll find diary entries, but it's really not comparing apples to apples uh, when, you, when you're looking at this from the historian's vantage point. Um, and that makes it very difficult uh, you know, to, to give the same critical assessment to the actions, um, behaviors, and policies of either Palestinian leadership within Palestine uh, or the Arab leadership on the outside. Uh, and um, obviously, this is something that we still deal with today. Anyone who is interested, I'm happy to give you a list of some. Uh, some of this is really, really recent reading material. There is an endless, endless supply uh, of uh, political scientists, historians, um, uh, anthropologists, uh, etc., who, who continue to explore this era, uh, and um, I'm sure that's not going to change anytime soon. Uh, so I, I look forward to engaging you with some conversation over dinner and afterwards. I thank you for your patience. Uh, I know this is a lot of material, and you're stuck listening to me. So I hope you enjoyed it.